Hi folks. I had planned this episode for next season, but brought it forward, because at the moment the Ballymurphy Massacre has been quite relevant. This episode is being published in late May 2021, and earlier this month, an inquest into the Ballymurphy Massacre was released to the public. It's something that made front page news in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, and there has been a lot of discussion about it all week. So I felt now would be the right time to release an episode on it. Also, just a reminder that if you're enjoying this podcast, you can support the podcast over at patreon.com forward slash the troubles podcast. There you will get early episodes, ad free episodes, as well as companion videos after each episode and some media related to the troubles. If you'd prefer to support the podcast in a once off fashion, you can do so at buymeacoffee.com forward slash troubles podcast. Alternatively, just tell your friends or leave a review. Everything helps. Thank you. August 9th, 1971 in Northern Ireland. The British Army has just launched Operation Demetrius, which was an operation aimed at completely smashing the IRA. Ultimately, the operation was a complete failure, and in the district of Ballymurphy in Belfast, 11 people would lose their lives at the hand of British soldiers. But it would be almost 50 years later that the families of the victims would ever get some sort of closure. This is the story of the Ballymurphy Massacre. This is the Troubles Podcast, a podcast which explores the violence and bloodshed that occurred in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain, as multiple sides and organisations waged a bloody conflict over the status of Northern Ireland. Ballymurphy is a small, predominantly Catholic cluster of housing estates on the western side of the city of Belfast. Back in the 70s, it was one of the poorest estates in Belfast. The houses were built to an extremely poor standard and there were no shops or facilities. Job prospects were also very low. One source I came across said that 50% of all adults were unemployed. The area also experienced overcrowding as there were a large number of residents in temporary accommodation as they waited for Divis flats to be built. The poverty of Ballymurphy was so significant that it caught the attention of Mother Teresa, who was perhaps one of the most well-known religious figures in recent history. She was canonised as a saint in 2016, but her life's work has also received a lot of criticism, saying that her clinics received millions in funding but lacked basic facilities. One academic said of her, quote, Mother Teresa believed the sick must suffer like Christ on the cross. Aware of the situation in Northern Ireland, Mother Teresa and four other Sisters of Charity moved into 123 Spring Hill Avenue in the heart of Ballymurphy in October 1971. They ended up staying there for 18 months, with her attending Mass every Sunday in the local church. Mother Teresa and her fellow missionaries embedded themselves into the community, providing food to families that needed it. They were accepted by them, but strangely enough, it all came to an abrupt end amidst rumours that the senior clergy who were there at the time didn't want them there. The real reason has never been revealed, but there has been speculation that the senior priest, Canon Porrick Murphy, forced her out though there are sources I've come across that also say Mother Teresa says that she left of her own free will. I've spoken about this before, but the poverty in areas like Ballymurphy did not happen by chance. This was a conscious effort by the Unionist government to maintain power in favour of Unionist people in Northern Ireland. A number of policies were enforced to make this happen, one such being that you could only vote if you owned a property, something which significantly few Catholics did. There were even areas that were made up of majority Catholics, but the electoral boundaries were divided up in such a way that the Unionists still had more voting power. Nationalist people in Northern Ireland were second-class citizens. They couldn't get certain jobs, especially in government. They were also heavily discriminated against when it came to social housing. Ballymurphy was right beside New Barnsley area of Belfast, which was Protestant, and from the very outset of the Troubles, Ballymurphy would go on to become a focal point for the violence that would occur in Northern Ireland. Those living in the poorest areas of Belfast often had to bear the brunt of the violence at the onset of the Troubles. The Nationalist people also felt that the Northern Irish Police Force, the RUC, were heavily biased against them. So when the British Army was deployed to restore law and order into Northern Ireland in late August 1969, They were initially welcomed by the nationalist people, 
and believed that they would be a neutral force who would protect them against the RUC. This unfortunately was not the case and the tide soon turned against the army once nationalists realised that the army was there to restore things to as they were into a unionist country for unionist people. This went against the wishes of the nationalists who began a campaign for equal rights. Civil demonstrations were met with violence and the army also began to develop a reputation of becoming more and more heavy-handed against nationalist people. As this violence between army and protesters ramped up, so did the IRA activity. The IRA had been relatively dormant for most of the 60s. Their border campaign, which took place between 1956 and 1962, was largely considered a failure and they hadn't been very active since. In the late 60s, as the RUC was cracking down on the nationalist civil rights campaigners, people were wondering where the IRA was gone. There were anti-IRA slogans written on walls, saying things along the lines of IRA equals I ran away. Amidst this pressure, in 1969 the IRA split into two groups, the original IRA and the provisional IRA. The original IRA had been leaning into socialism, and they were looking to unite workers from both sides of the sectarian divide, whereas the provisional IRA wanted to use force to collapse the Northern Irish government and force the British government withdraw from Ireland altogether. This IRA split happened four months after the arrival of the British army, and the provisional IRA were now committed to armed resistance of the nationalist areas, from loyalists and now the British army. In their search for IRA members, the army continued to target young Catholic men from nationalist areas. So initially, the resistance from areas like Ballymurphy came from women who thought that the army wouldn't touch them. Whenever the army was coming in, the women would come out of their homes and begin banging bin lids on the ground to warn people that they had arrived. During 1970 and 1971, there were clashes between the British army and the provisional IRA. These clashes grew more and more violent. Loyalists demanded that the Unionist Prime Minister, Brian Faulkner, introduce internment, which was the ability to detain suspected paramilitaries and keep them indefinitely without charge or trial. Here's Faulkner describing it. The main target of the present operation is the Irish Republican Army. I ask those who will quite sincerely consider the use of internment powers as evil to answer honestly this question. Is it more of an evil than to allow the perpetrators of these outrages to remain at liberty? And so began Operation Demetrius. A list of 450 names was drawn up and the 1st Battalion of the Parachute Regiment who went by the name One Para, were selected to carry out the operation. They were an elite, aggressive fighting unit of the British Army. They were conceived in World War II and would be considered Britain's shock troops, expertly trained to carry out sudden assaults. It has been argued that sending in an aggressive unit such as this into a complex and nuanced situation such as the Troubles was the wrong move and led to a significant increase in violence. At 4am in the morning on August 9th, 1971, the people of Ballymurphy were awoken to the sound of banging of bin lids as the soldiers arrived into the estate. It's worth mentioning that this operation only targeted Republicans. Though loyalist paramilitary groups like the UVF had been operating by now, this initial operation was only targeting nationalists, which contributed to the feeling that the army was not a neutral force. Doors were broken into, Batten rounds were fired through windows and people were dragged from their beds. There are accounts of family members being threatened, verbally assaulted and physically assaulted by the soldiers. In some cases, entire families were arrested. Unfortunately, the intelligence that the army received was quite poor and as a result, many completely innocent people were scooped up. As well as that, the Republican community in Belfast had got wind of the operation the night before so were able to disappear before they would be picked up. The IRA was well aware they wouldn't win in a flat-out assault against the enemy. 
Later that evening, a loyalist mob had gathered to watch what was going on in Springfield Park in Ballymurphy. They began breaking windows and intimidating the Catholic residents. Scared for their lives, the residents began evacuating their homes. To do so, some of them would need to cross over a grassy area known as Finley's Field. As they were evacuating, some soldiers had set up a sniping position on the roof of a building on Spring Martin Road, which overlooked Springfield Park and Finley's Field. Bobby Clark was crossing over the field when he spotted the soldiers. He broke into a run, and then, afraid that he would be shot, he began zigzagging. The soldiers shot at him, and he was hit in the side and fell to the ground. Bobby was seriously injured in the shooting, but ultimately survived. Father Mullen was a 38-year-old Catholic priest whose house was directly in front of Finley's Park. Word reached him that Bobby was shot and lying in the field, so Father Mullen phoned the army to warn them that they were shooting at innocent civilians, and then he went to Bobby's aid, reportedly waving a white handkerchief or white baby's nappy above his head at the soldiers on the roof to show that he meant no harm. He was a few metres away from Bobby when he was struck with a bullet, he fell to the ground and tried to crawl away but was shot again. Some sources I came across say that for the first 10 minutes he was praying in English and Latin before eventually going quiet. He bled to death after about 20 minutes. It was here at this field at, at the rear of Springfield Park that Father Mullen was shot. He'd been in his home about 150 yards away when word reached him that a man had been shot and wounded in the field. Father Mullen immediately left his house and rushed to the scene, braving a hail of crossfire as he did so. Waving a white handkerchief, he approached the wounded man. But as he did so, he was hit by a burst of automatic fire. He fell and began to crawl away, but was hit again. The first aid men who'd seen the incident rushed forward to help him, but the gunfire continued. And an 18-year-old youth, Francis Reed, who'd also rushed to the scene, was shot through the head. 19-year-old Francis, or Frank Quinn, was then shot in the back of the head as he ran to the aid of the wounded men. He died instantly. The soldiers on the roof would later claim that they were aiming at a gunman. The second incident occurred just a few minutes after the shooting on the roofs in Ballymurphy, around a building which had been commandeered by the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment, or 2PARA. They had seized a building known as the Henry Taggart Hall as their base and had been placing nationalists who'd been arrested there. As the day wore on, women and youths gathered outside. Some were looking for their family members who'd been arrested, and some youths were expressing their anger at the army, attacking the barracks with stones and bottles. A crowd of loyalists then appeared, and the nationalist youths confronted them. 44-year-old mother of eight, Joan Connolly, was standing outside with her daughter Breege, watching the events unfold. When the soldiers first came into Belfast, Joan welcomed them, and she would make them tea. In fact, two years before this incident, one of her daughters had married a British soldier, so she had very little animosity towards them. Breege wanted to head over and see the rioters, but Joan said to stay near the British soldiers and not go near the Loyalist rioters. She said to her, quote, No, because the Loyalists will shoot you, but the army won't. The army then fired CS gas into the crowd and Breege lost sight of her mother. She then got frightened and went home, waiting for Joan to come home. But she never did. Joan was standing in an area known as the Old Manse, opposite the base. She joined up with a group of neighbours and they were chatting. Without any warning, the paratroopers suddenly began firing indiscriminately across the road. Everyone scattered and tried to take cover from the hail of gunfire. The first person to get shot was 20-year-old Noel Phillips. He was struck in the hip and lying on the ground. According to Breege, Joan believed that because she was a woman, the army wouldn't shoot her. She shouted over to Noel, Son, don't be crying, I'll help you. Another shot then rang out and struck Joan in the face, blinding her. An autopsy later revealed that Joan was also shot in the shoulder, hand and thigh. Daniel, or Danny Taggart, was also struck in the leg as he ran with Noel Phillips and he fell to the ground. He was then shot 13 more times as he lay on the ground. 41-year-old Joseph Murphy was also hit in the thigh and he fell to the ground. 
The army entered the field around 9.30 in the evening to remove the dead and wounded. Joan's body was not removed from the field by the soldiers until hours later, at around 2.30 in the morning, and I found some sources saying that she was crying out for help for many hours before she eventually bled to death. Joseph and Danny were brought into the hall by soldiers, along with three other wounded men. There are accounts of the men being beaten by the soldiers once they arrived at the army base, with objects being shoved into their existing wounds, and one account of Joseph being shot at close range by a rubber bullet into his existing wound. Joseph would eventually succumb to his injuries three weeks later. Danny would also succumb to his injuries, but not before being brought to an army hospital. Alice Harper, who was the daughter of Danny Taggart, recalls trying to find her father, as she didn't know if he was interned or not. She remembered how she went from army post to army post, trying to find her father. And there was one incident where she walked away from one army post, and she heard the soldiers sing lyrics from the song, Where's Your Papa Gone? Where's your papa gone? Where's your papa gone? This song was very popular in the charts at the time, and during my research I found at least two other instances where members of the British Army sang this song at people who lost their parents in the Ballamurphy Massacre. The following day, on August 10th, there would be another killing. The atmosphere in Ballamurphy had distinctly changed after the first day, with a mother and priest amongst the dead. The locals were terrified and angry at the British Army and went about setting up barricades on the roads to prevent the army accessing their areas. The army quickly got to work dismantling all of the barricades. 31-year-old father of four, Eddie Doherty, had heard that things were bad in Ballamurphy and wanted to check on some family. As he approached a barricade on the White Rock Road, he spotted someone he knew and began chatting to him. Then, without warning, Eddie fell to the ground. He had been shot in the back by a soldier who was part of the group dismantling the barricades. The soldier claimed that Eddie was a petrol bomber or that there was ammunition found on his body when he was searched. A forensic report later said that there was no residue from a gun or from petrol bombs on his hands. August 11th was the third day of Operation Demetrius and four more people would eventually lose their lives. It was 4am and people awoke to the sound of bin lids once again. Members of one para had been sent into Ballymurphy to demolish barricades and disperse the crowd. In total, 600 soldiers descended upon Ballymurphy that day. 43-year-old Joseph Corr and 20-year-old John Laverty were both on White Rock Road when they were shot. Joseph was shot multiple times and died of his injuries 16 days later. John was shot twice, once in the back and then an autopsy report revealed that he was shot a second time in the thigh. The bullet entered his thigh and travelled up into his torso, fatally injuring him. The path of the bullet showed that he had been shot while he was lying on the ground, and in the words of his sister Rita, quote, When he was shot, he would have been lying down. He posed no threat to anyone and they were able to shoot him, tell lies about him, and get away with it basically. They got away with murder. 49-year-old John McCurr was a carpenter who had lost his hand fighting in the Second World War for the British Army. On the day in question, he was standing outside a Catholic church where he was doing some work, and he had just taken a break as there was a funeral taking place, when he was shot in the head by an unknown sniper, dying of his injuries nine days later. 44-year-old Paddy McCarthy was a youth worker based in Ballymurphy. On the afternoon of August the 11th, he loaded up a cart with milk and bread and planned on giving it out to the children who were trapped in the area, as the army weren't letting people leave Ballymurphy. As he was doing so, he came across a group of paratroopers. Again, the sources vary here. One source says that they threatened him and a soldier fired a shot above his head. Another source says that they put an unloaded pistol in his mouth and carried out a mock execution. Either way, shortly after the altercation, Paddy suffered a heart attack and died. The raids and searches continued through Ballymurphy all day, with more people being arrested and shot. Operation Demetrius and the internment of hundreds of people led to four days of violence across all of Northern Ireland. Parts of Belfast descended into absolute chaos. 
One journalist, Kevin Myers, described it as, quote, Insanity seized the city. Hundreds of vehicles were hijacked and factories were burnt. Loyalist and IRA gunmen were everywhere. In total, 20 civilians, two IRA members and two British soldiers were killed in the first four days of internment. Of those 20, 11 were killed in Ballymurphy. As well as that, an estimated 7,000 Catholic people were forced to flee their homes. Breege, who was the daughter of Joan who I mentioned earlier, was one of those 7,000, who fled Northern Ireland to refugee camps set up by the Irish government in the Republic of Ireland. In the wake of the shootings, the British Army were quick to start spinning a particular narrative to the media, stating that they were defending themselves against violent gunmen. This morning, the army was only guessing at the number who died. It's all they can do. Nobody really knows how many snipers were hit by army shots, and the soldiers are convinced that several dead snipers have yet to be recovered from where they lie at their firing points. On the 11th of August, an article appeared in the Belfast Telegraph saying, quote, Two gunmen were shot dead and another seriously wounded in a two-hour gun battle with troops at Ballymurphy early this morning. The article went on to say that paratroopers fought as many as 20 gunmen who were armed with Thompson submachine guns, pistols and rifles. The article was talking about Joseph, John and the other John that I mentioned earlier. Joseph's daughter said of the article that the British Army fed the papers the story which was completely untrue. People then read the papers and began to believe that her father was an IRA gunman and began sending hate mail to her now widowed mother. In the days, months and years following these killings, there was never an investigation, which meant that the statement from the British Army was the only official version of events of what happened. And this version accused many of the 11 people killed as being killed while engaging in paramilitary activity. These claims have no basis in truth, but without an investigation, they were all that was out there. The army maintained their story, that they were engaged in a violent gunfight with paramilitaries, that may have been the case in some parts of Belfast at the time, but in Ballamurphy there is very little to no evidence that there were paramilitaries shooting at soldiers. For many years, the victims' families were alone in their grief, completely unaware that there were many others like them who'd experienced this tragedy over those three days. With the army maintaining their story, the reputation of the 11 people killed in Ballymurphy was tarnished and the families wanted to clear their loved ones' names. They eventually banded together and began to demand answers from the British Army and began to refer to the three days collectively as the Ballymurphy Massacre. The families got to work and plotted out where the killings happened on a map and then went door to door asking the locals if they had lived there when the killings occurred. In this way, they collected over 130 witness statements from people who had never been interviewed before this point. The statements provided some very startling insights into what really happened that day, and it was drastically different from the story released by the British Army. They revealed that in the case of 20-year-old Noel Phillips, who was shot beside Joan, that the first gunshot didn't kill him. Here's an account from a person who witnessed it happening when they were a child. Quote, He kept crying as he was in so much pain. One of the soldiers had a side-arm gun and pulled it out and said, Fuck up, you cunt, and then shot him dead. As part of their investigation, the family finally got a hold of Noel's autopsy report, which revealed that there were two bullet wounds in the back of his head. These bullet wounds were consistent with someone standing over a person and shooting downward, revealing that Noel was executed. Medical experts also investigated the autopsy reports of the rest of the dead, in the case of Joan Connolly, who was shot in the face, then lay dying in a field for hours, the autopsy revealed that her gunshot wounds were not fatal and she would have had survived if the army had sought medical attention for her, as opposed to leaving her bleeding to death in a field. The family also got access to individual soldier statements from the days in question. These statements are the only official record of what happened on the day. Breege explained that in the statements, three soldiers have claimed that Joan was shooting at them. She explained, quote, Three soldiers are taking responsibility for shooting her. 
One said she was shooting at him with a handgun and he shot her and she fell back and got up and carried on shooting. Another soldier said she was going through the grass firing at him and he shot her. Another one said she was sitting in the middle of the field with a machine gun firing at him. I come on. This was a granny at 44 years of age. This was no Annie Oakley. A solicitor for the families of the victims, Porik O'Murig, explained that in the case of the killing of Eddie Daugherty who was shot beside the barricades, the statement of Soldier B who shot him changed drastically over the course of a year. The first statement to the British military police said that he emptied his cartridge firing the weapon. But his second statement given to the coroner one year later said that he fired one shot only. Eddie's son expressed his anger at the soldier's statement, quote, I just fail to understand how the man that murdered my father made two different statements, two totally different statements, and both of them are lies. One saying my father was a petrol bomber, the other saying he was a gunman. They were both lies. My father, when he was found, hadn't any gun residue, no petrol on his hands, no thing. My father was a peace-loving man who was like everyone else. The RUC, at the time, did not perform an adequate investigation into the attacks. They did not obtain witness statements and soldiers were not cross-examined. An inquest did take place in 1972, one year later, but it revealed nothing and was little more than a formality. The military had little interest in taking part in inquests or court cases that would further incriminate their members. Less than six months after the events of Ballymurphy, members of one para were sent from Belfast to Derry to help control the crowd at an anti-internment march. The events of that day would lead to the death of 14 innocent people in a day that would become known as Bloody Sunday. Bloody Sunday and the Ballymurphy massacre have a lot of similarities. The largest one being that both were carried out by the same battalion of the British Army, one para. In both cases, completely innocent civilians were killed by a battalion of the British Army who were known for being overly heavy-handed. In both cases, the story was also spun in a way that made it look like the army were being fired upon, which wasn't the case at all. The big difference between the two is that there were no journalists present or camera crews documenting the events in Ballymurphy, like there was a Bloody Sunday. So as a result, Ballymurphy was somewhat forgotten even though it has been referred to as Belfast's Bloody Sunday. It does raise the question though, if the army were aware of how violent one power operated in Ballymurphy, why did they feel the need to send them to patrol a civil rights march in Derry just six months later? One documentary that I came across raised the point that Derry had a number of barricades and no-go areas set up, which was a slap in the face to the authority of the British army at the time and it would have been in their interest to take these barricades apart like they did in Ballymurphy. After mounting pressure, an inquest began in September 2018. The findings were released on the 11th of May 2021, just a few months shy of the 50-year anniversary of the Ballymurphy massacre. The findings made front-page news in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. The marathon march for the truth is over. The families of those killed arriving at the coroner's court in another twist in the saga which parallels Bloody Sunday. The deaths, then the long, long campaign to have their reputations restored of their loved ones. The coroner, Siobhan Keegan, needed about two and a half hours to deliver the truth. The families of those killed and injured needed half a century. Justice Keegan was presiding over the inquest and found that the 10 civilians killed were completely innocent and that the use of lethal force by the British Army was not justified. The 11th victim, Paddy McCarthy, was not a part of this inquest as he died of a heart attack. She did acknowledge that there was some IRA activity in the area, but she did not believe that there was a large number of them, though there was evidence that the army were shot at. Keegan said she accepts that soldiers are entitled to protect themselves and the fact there was some engagement with gunmen, but there was no evidence the deceased were linked to any activity or even in proximity to any activity. Keegan also said that with the military, as trained soldiers must act within the legal parameters 
and there has to be a minimization of risk to protect life, saying, quote, The use of force was clearly disproportionate given the number of civilians around in a highly charged atmosphere. I do not go as far to say as there was a conspiracy, but there were serious failings. The findings of this inquest finally gave a small amount of relief to the families of the victims, as the names of their loved ones had finally been cleared. Shortly after the release of the inquest findings, the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, issued a carefully worded apology to the families of the victims. The letter read, quote, Those who died over that terrible period were innocent of any wrongdoing. The events at Ballymurphy should never have happened. You should never have had to experience such grief at the loss of your loved ones and such distress in your subsequent quest for truth. The duty of the state is to hold itself to the highest standard and that requires us to recognise the hurt and agony caused when we fall short of those standards. For what happened on those terrible few days in Ballymurphy and for what the families have gone through since you began your brave and dignified campaign almost five decades ago, I am truly sorry. I recognise that no words of apology can make up for the lasting pain that you have endured. Thank you for the dignity and strength you have shown. As of writing, which is shortly after the release of this apology, the families have rejected it, saying that it was an apology to third parties and not directly to them. Here's John Taggart, whose father was killed in the massacre, quote, It's not a public apology. What kind of insult is it to families that he couldn't have the conversation with ourselves? His office couldn't come and speak to the families of what he was doing. That's not acceptable to the families and never will be. This is not an apology to us. Another factor that further upset families was news that the British government was looking into giving an amnesty to British soldiers who were accused of crimes during the Troubles by adding something along the lines of a statute of limitations to soldiers involved in crimes during the Troubles. In some cases, such as Bloody Sunday, victims' families are still trying to prosecute those who were involved in the killing of their loved ones. After this news was leaked, Britain quickly backtracked, but as of writing, the story is developing. Instead of dismantling the IRA, Operation Demetrius and the internment caused such an outrage and an anger amongst the nationalist people that it led to a large increase in membership to the provisional IRA. In the case of the Ballymurphy massacre, there's probably still more to come. The families are now calling for an investigation to be carried out as to why the British Army killed citizens they were tasked with protecting. Some of the soldiers who were involved in the shootings are still alive, but would be well into their 70s by now. Only time will tell if that investigation ever takes place. Thanks, and see you next time.